Hello there, my little custard tarts. Welcome to this Rambling Witch episode. Thank you for joining me. I'm very excited to do this one. I want to begin by thanking my doll faces and pop tarts over on my Patreon for choosing this particular subject. Every single month, the doll faces and pop tarts are given the opportunity to vote on a monthly video that will be the next one to come out on my channel. And this month, they have selected for me to talk about the assumptions, the mistakes, the misunderstandings that people have about witches. There are so many different ways that you could go with a video like this. There's so much that I could say that I didn't say, either because I didn't think of it at the time of making the notes for the video, or it's not something I particularly want to get into. But there are an array of assumptions that you could list as being sort of like misunderstandings that people make about the craft and about the way that witches operate, the way that we think and feel, the way that we view the world. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about some of the parts of this subject that occur to me and that I find to be funny or that I've previously found to be irritating. Grab a beverage because you can see by the timestamp that I'm going to be going into quite a lot of territory. But then, you know, what's new for me, really? I'm going to have a coffee because it's first thing in the morning, so I'm going to wake myself up. I just want to say before I begin that I love this jumper. Red is one of my favourite colours of all time. And this is a new addition to my collection of jumpers. I love it so much. It says London, England on it and it's got a crown on it. It's really oversized and you've got like the royal lions either side. So I really, I really like it. It's dead good. And also uh, some of my Pop-Tarts patrons will recognise these snazzy Batman pyjama bottoms. I know it's not the first time you've seen them <laughs> if you joined me for the live in July. Right, I've been wanting to get this first one off of my chest for a long time now and I've never really had the opportunity to do it on the channel, it's never really come up and now I feel is the perfect time for me to get this off of my chest. So a very long time ago, somebody was talking to me about hexes and curses and that kind of thing and I said that I don't do them, I don't do that kind of magic, it's not my bag, baby. And their response to that was something along the lines of it must be nice to have lived such a, a good life, such a positive life, with such positive interactions with people that you've never needed to hex or curse anybody. Bitch. <laughs> no. Nine. No. Niet. Nay. And no in other languages as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, my decision not to hex people or curse people has got nothing to do with the fabric of the life that I've lived, okay? It's not a simple case of witches who refrain from cursing or hexing have never had any reason to do so or to feel like they would like to do so. It's just simply a case of what your ethics come down to, what you think you would feel right about and what you wouldn't feel right about. And the other thing that I want to say is a sort of a, a misunderstanding that's attached to this is the idea that if a witch doesn't hex or curse and they state for the record that they do not hex or curse, then it means that they must judge witches who do. That's also a misunderstanding. I do not inherently judge witches who perform curses or hexes or anything of that sort. Um, it's just simply a personal choice for me that I do not. I responded to this person at the time during the conversation and I remember saying to them, you know, I think it's very interesting that you have assumed that because hexing and cursing doesn't form a part of my particular witchcraft practice, you would assume that nobody has ever treated me ill or trespassed against me or made me feel like maybe I wanted to hex or curse them. <laughs> it's interesting that you've made that leap from looking at the fact that I don't hex or curse people and deciding that that automatically means I've led a charmed life and nobody's ever done me any wrong and I've never experienced cruelty or betrayal or anything like that. That's quite a big leap, isn't it? Don't you think? It's quite a big leap. Um, and the person did concede that, yeah, okay, that's fine. That's quite a big leap, you know? Because I wanted to make that point because I was like, wow, there's so many witches that don't necessarily see hexing or cursing as something that they would add to their personal uh, witchy toolkit of things that they would pull out and to be honest with you even though I wouldn't pull it out of my personal witchy toolkit for me that doesn't mean that I don't think I can do it either I do believe that I can do it I fully believe that I can hex a person I can curse a person uh, it's not that I have that a lack of belief around my ability to do that it's literally uh, my desire to do that is not there and even when I'm very much in the midst of processing you know, the betrayal that I've gone through, the ill treatment that I've experienced at the hands of somebody. I'm just not really about that particular life. I just, for me, 
hexing and cursing doesn't make sense in terms of the way I view my craft and what I use it for. I just don't personally happen to feel that it's relevant to my practice. I don't think that it's something that comes under my particular witchcraft umbrella. And I'm going to leave down below a video that I made about hexing and cursing and why I don't particularly partake in those things, what the logic is for me. And even though it was made quite a few years ago now, I hope and I definitely think, as far as I recall, that I made an attempt during that video to let people know it's not a judgment of people do, who do hex or curse. Absolutely not. I think every practitioner has to reach that decision for themselves. And I think sometimes uh, something happens during a witch's life that makes them very sharply turn a corner on that, whether they turn away from hexing and cursing, which they previously were comfortable with, or conversely, whether they actually turn towards hexing and cursing from previously being very much set against it. So I definitely think that life is long enough for us to re-examine our responses to the whole concept of hexing and cursing. I will say for the record that I do consider binding and banishing to be different from cursing and hexing. And even though I wouldn't necessarily personally curse or hex, I definitely have performed bindings and I definitely would perform a banishing, I think, if the situation called for it. Although I have actually never done that so far on my witchcraft journey that I remember anyway, you know, I'm in my mid thirties now and I've been identifying as a witch since I was like 11 or 12. So, you know, I, it's been going on for quite a while now, this witchy business. So I think I've gotten out everything I wanted to say about hexes and curses and how you know a, a witch's unwillingness or lack of desire to do hexing and cursing does not mean that they've led a charmed life it does not mean that they've never had anything bad happen to them the next thing I want to get out of the way is the idea that people have that chaos magicians chaos magic practitioners chaos witches are inherently chaotic in their approach to magic and their execution of magical workings. I have made videos on my channel about chaos magic, I've spoken about chaos magic and described myself as a chaos witch. And because of that, I can tell you that there is a big misunderstanding about what the word chaos means when we assign it to witchcraft and when we assign it to our magical outlook. When I talk about the way that I organise my magic, my record keeping, the way that I use journals and organisers and stuff, the way that I approach time management, I invariably get one or two comments underneath those kinds of videos saying things like, aren't you supposed to be a chaos witch? Where's the chaos in any of this? You're far too organized to be a chaos witch. I thought you were supposed to be tapping into the whole energy of chaos. Why are you so rigid? Why are you so organized? Why would you set your practice up like this? Why would you set your life up like this? And then refer to yourself as a chaos witch. This is just a massive misunderstanding of what chaos witch means, what chaos magic is all about. There is no reason why somebody who is a chaos magic practitioner would not keep a very regimented record of what they have done, what they've tweaked and changed, what workings they've done and on what date they've done them. People, I think, just get very hung up on their rigid view of what the word chaos means and what it applies to, what the definition, therefore, of a chaos magician or a chaos witch would be. And actually, it's not to do with being disorganized and in chaos and discombobulated and untidy and haphazard at all. It's not about having this ramshackle practice where nothing is documented and nothing is organised and there's no plan. Peter J. Carroll coined the term chaos magic and the reason that he used chaos had nothing to do with that. In fact, he said himself, chaos is the force which has caused life to evolve itself outside of dust and is currently most concentratedly manifest in the human life force where it is the source of consciousness. Chaos is the thing responsible for the origin and continued action of events and goes on to say it could well be called God or Tao, but the name chaos is virtually meaningless and free from the anthropomorphic ideas of religion. Chaos is a word that is being used to represent the force that drives everything and the energy behind everything rather than being indicative of you know a practitioner being haphazard being all over the place you know not doing any record keeping not having any plan right i'm glad that we got that one out of the way because that's been a bit of a bloody assumption that i've wanted to clear up for some time now i'm gonna pop to the shop <laughs> so i'll see you the other side of a jump cart because i'm really hungry and i don't have any bloody food in my house Oh, I just had some sushi for my breakfast because I am winning at life. And the next thing that I want to talk about in relation to mistakes, misunderstandings, etc., concerning witchcraft happens to be the topic of appreciation versus appropriation when it comes to culture, when it comes to um, cultural traditions, um, different ideas, different theological frameworks, different practices. I don't wanna go on about this point too long because I do actually have a video that outlines some of my views on cultural appropriation and I'm gonna leave that video down below for you if you have not seen it. 
at one point it was my most requested video topic and in the end I just had to bite the bullet and go for it and say what I think but it definitely wasn't what I would call an all-encompassing video that explains everything that I think and feel about appropriation, cultural appropriation but I don't want to stick on this for too long because I do feel like I pretty much did outline the ideas that I think it's important to put forth in that video from before. But what I will say is that I do think that in the very important dialogue about cultural appropriation and within the desire that witches have not to be culturally appropriative, I do feel that there is a lot of nitpicking that goes on and there is a lot of attacking of individuals that goes on without the full context or the full facts that would actually ascertain whether or not somebody is being appropriative or not in a specific circumstance. Just for an example, I have definitely seen YouTube videos where somebody has been sitting in their bedroom or in their living room and behind them in the distance or just somewhere off to the side, they have something that is from a culture that doesn't appear to be the culture of the speaker in the video. And in the comments underneath the video, I've seen people saying, oh, you know, you've got a waving cat, but you're not from that tradition. You don't understand what the waving cat is all about. Or I can see in the background that you've got a dream catcher. Well, you're not supposed to have a dream catcher. And I just think to myself, look, you first of all, you've got no context for why that thing is there. You do not know why it is there. You do not understand why it is there. It could be a souvenir that a relative brought back for that person from their holiday and then that relative is no longer around or they don't get to see that relative very often. It could be from a friend that comes from that cultural background who wanted them to have it as a gift. You don't know the origin story for why that thing is in that room and you don't know how it ended up being in that room. You don't know how money changed hands, if indeed money changed hands at all. You don't know how consciously that item was procured. You don't know who was paid for that item, where that item was made. So there's a lot of stabbing in the dark when it comes to attacking individuals for things that they appear to have in their home for things that they appear to be interested in that you can see from the videos that they make or from something that they wear and i just feel like there's so much of a there's so much of people being on the attack when it comes to perceived cultural appropriation with with little to no context for what is actually going on and for what the person intends by what they wear or by what they have in their home and that kind of winds me up in my personal view the discussion around cultural appropriation is probably far more useful when we're thinking about power structures when we're thinking about systemic oppression and whether or not we are thinking about remuneration for a marginalised culture whose items or whose practices are being um, emulated or being appreciated. Without a doubt, there are definitely traditions which are closed, religious and cultural traditions which are closed, meaning that anybody outside of that culture should not be messing with those traditions or practices. I get that, I do understand that. But I do think at the same time that there is this rampant, almost aggression, this nitpicking and this quickness to come in with an assumption about what somebody's intentions are with a specific object or with a specific practice, with no context, no questions being asked, nothing like that. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. In fact, I've seen a lot of misunderstanding going around in the community when people are just hell bent on making the point that someone is being appropriative in some way. You know, sometimes I think we're just way too quick to judge somebody's individual intention or somebody's um, level of ignorance uh, around a certain thing. A lot of people who are kind of preoccupied with cultural appropriation to a large extent tend to start focusing on individuals that they can get into argy-bargy debates with rather than thinking about the much bigger picture. Obviously individual responsibility is important and we can look at what we can do individually, obviously, but I think that there's too many people that are like, I'm just going to rip it out of this person that's got this thing that I don't think they should have in their room or they've got this thing that I don't think they should be wearing or whatever. And I'm going to get into this very personal um, argument with them or rip a strip off of them without having the information and without actually inquiring and being inquisitive as to their position. But I'm not going to go after this massive company that are actually manufacturing en masse these items from a marginalised culture and not giving anything back to that culture and making massive amounts of money out of that culture in a highly appropriative way. I'm not going to go after that massive company, I'm just going to rip it out of this girl on YouTube that happens to have this thing that has an Aztec print on it and it's like for God's sake, I just, I sometimes feel like it's unfortunate that this vehement, very passionate energy around the subject doesn't always seem to be lending itself to the most useful direction some of the time and I do think people are prone to just kind of like filling in the blanks, filling in the gaps, making up a story about somebody when that's not necessarily the case.
one thing that I wanted to talk about in this Rambling Witch episode is correspondences and the use of tables of correspondences. I sometimes feel like there might be a bit of an all or nothing mentality around correspondences. And what I like to do is feel that I can use them and I can take them as far as I feel like taking them. I can um, I can decide where they're useful for me or where they clarify for me what I've been feeling about a specific tool that I've been using or a specific you know aspect of the craft that I've been thinking about but I don't need to swallow the table of correspondences wholesale. And you will notice that with many, 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 many of the witchy books that you purchase and read, there is a table of correspondences. And the table of correspondences, you know, explains what all the different phases of the moon mean, what all the different herbs can be used for, what the crystals are used for, um, what the colours mean and stuff like that. And there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of consensus around these things. I don't really want to throw the baby out with the correspondences bathwater. You know, I take from it what I can take from it. I leave behind what I can leave behind. I'm definitely not going to be told outright what the meanings for things are or what things should be used for because my personal gnosis and my experiential evidence is all always going to be of importance and if I feel like something can be used for a different thing in my craft and it's not necessarily I'm not necessarily vibing with what the table of correspondences says to me then I'm going to go with what I personally have experienced and I'm going to go with what feels powerful for me but I definitely think at the same time that tables of correspondences can be useful they can have their place and actually it's useful to just have an awareness of what the consensus is around various tools like stones and um, herbs and that kind of thing but at the same time, it's really great to know that you are absolutely entitled to and allowed to formulate your own working relationship with different tools. And one of the main reasons it's so important to know that you can do that is because there are going to be certain tools in your witchy practice that you really feel a strong connection to. You feel that there's great potency there for you with those tools, with those correspondences, and um, you're going to want to forge your own relationship with them, which is quite different from anything that you've read about those things. And you need to have permission to do that. So even if you do go with the consensus on various things, there might be some strong connections that you feel to certain tools in your witchy practice, um, certain elements, certain colours, certain moon phases, whatever it might be. And you might really depart from the consensus around what that tool is supposed to mean and what it's for. If you have a very strong leaning towards that tool, you're going to want to figure out what your relationship with it is. And you don't want to have that dictated to you by witchcraft books. The whole idea that witchcraft is anti-science and that you either have to be a witch or you have to believe in modern science and never the two shall meet. <sighs> I don't really think I need to go on about this one for too long. I think that it's obvious what I mean. I don't really need to delve into it any more than that. Witches are so often not only appreciative of modern science and reading about it and learning about it, but also can be quite nerdy about it, like super geeky about it. So witches are not in conflict with science. That That's just as simple as it is. The vast majority of witches do not feel at all in conflict with science. And I think what happens is that a lot of non-witches come along and they say, well, witches can't prove what they do. They can't prove that the things that they are doing are actually happening. They're just saying that these things are happening. They're saying that the spells are the spells are working and the rituals are potent and everything else, but they can't prove that. And, you know, witches are never saying that they have, you know, lots of, of peer reviews that can show what they do as being the truth empirically. It is a lot of personal gnosis and shared gnosis and anecdotal evidence and stuff like that. And I don't think witches really struggle to say that and to to own that. I think it's non-witches that come along and and decide that witch, witches are anti-science and that witchcraft is, is um, somehow in conflict with science. Witches are just basically of the belief that science has got a lot of things that it hasn't worked out yet. And we have so much more that we haven't even grasped. And a lot of the things that we are working with or that we believe we are working with when we practice the craft are things which science has not yet been able to fully grasp and explain. And and we're comfortable with that, basically. There are going to be some witches watching this episode who do not work with deity and have no intention of working with deity. They have never been called by deity. It is not their path. And for those witches, you might find that this point resonates with you. I have noticed that in a lot of cases, people will ask which deities a witch works with rather than asking if a witch works with deity in rather the same way as in certain parts of the world where, you know, a certain religion is still sort of uh, dominant culturally. People will ask, you know, where do you go to church or where do you go to synagogue or whatever, rather than asking, do you do you go to temple? Do you go to mosque? Do you go to church? Do you go to synagogue? 
So it's like this assumption, basically. And to me, I think that it could have something to do with the fact that there are so many people in the online sphere anyway, who talk about their connections with deity and really sort of put forth their impressions of the work that they do with deity and talk about how devoted they are to their deities. And so it sometimes does present the rather skewed appearance, the rather skewed feeling that the vast majority of witches work with deity. And that simply isn't the case. Um, I don't have any numbers for how many witches work with deity as opposed to not working with deity but I do sometimes find that there's a little bit of a slip up and it's not a bad thing it's not like oh my god you've just dropped a massive clanger you've totally put your foot in it but I do think sometimes people are just sort of assuming that witches work with deity when that might not be the case and they may have no interest in that or that may, might never have called to them necessarily I think without any shadow of a doubt there is also this assumption that witches are always bookworms witches are always incredibly well read on the subjects that they practice there is definitely an assumption that all witches are book witches or witches are you know bookworms and have their nose in a book all the time and that all witches have read the same things about the craft and um, even that the witches need to be particularly well read before they can start practicing the craft many witches are not well read in the subject of magic before practicing the craft because they feel instinctively drawn to practice the craft and so many of them will find that they have actually performed spells or done rituals before they've gotten into any serious reading and indeed before they were old enough to get into any serious reading and from that point on I think especially as a witch comes into online community or local community they might feel that they are being sort of railroaded into being a bookish witch whether or not that's actually the case for them they might not necessarily want to read lots of books on the subject of witchcraft it might not be how they feel that they best learn it might not be how they feel that they are moving towards the degree of potency that they want in their craft so it's not um, a foregone conclusion that because you're a witch, you're going to be a bookworm. And I would love to know down in the comments, are you the kind of witch that is not really super bookish and actually feels somewhat as though you ought to be somewhat pressured or intimidated do you feel like other witches are very bookish and you feel like you are not as um bookwormy by any stretch of the imagination and it's been weird for you or do you totally own the fact that you don't really enjoy to read about the craft and it's not an area that you feel you do lots of specialist research in or lots of study lots of reading and you're fine with that very 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 many people have assumed over the course of time that i'm always with my head in the witchy books and I'm always cracking books about the craft and about mysticism and about all the occult stuff and that simply isn't the case I'm, I'm often reading things aside from stuff to do with the craft and it's nice for me to have my little bouts over the course of a year or two where I will go back to witchcraft resources and I will bring in new witchcraft resources and I'll do that sumptuous witchy reading I do personally enjoy that but first of all it's not something that I spend the majority of my reading time on by any stretch it's not one of the things I enjoy to read most the majority of the time is stuff about the craft and secondly I don't feel that it is necessary to be a potent witch I really do not I think sometimes witchcraft just comes you know from somewhere deep inside from your personal notice and if you feel it's working for you that way if you feel you're getting the results and you feel good about what you're doing you don't necessarily feel curious about the occult you don't necessarily want to uh, read in order to specialize or dive deep with something why should you have to you know things are going well so um you know there's no need for you to feel pressured to bring something into your craft that isn't for you and that you don't feel moved to do not all witches are massive acquirers of, of witchy knowledge anyway not all witches are supposed to play that role i think that different witches find that their signature strengths lie in different areas and there are going to be some witches who feel massively compelled to learn everything about the craft or everything about specific aspects of the craft and there is that very sort of diligent uh, student archetype in a lot of witches but I definitely think that's not for everybody and it's not where everybody's signature strength lies and that's fine it's definitely a big stereotype that witches read a hell of a lot witches always have a stack of books on the go witches are always kind of like delving into something and underlining and making their own notes and constantly studying and I think that probably can be a little bit intimidating or alienating for people who don't actually experience their journey of the craft in that way in the past few years specifically I have definitely seen people saying that politics and witchcraft do not mix. I've also seen a very strong comeback from almost the entirely opposing direction on this from people saying that witchcraft and politics should always mix. There should never be witchcraft without politics. You, you shouldn't be able to say that you're a witch unless you're taking it to a political place. And I basically don't believe in either of these things. I don't believe that they've got to go together and I don't believe that they should always stay apart. I believe that it's obviously down to the individual. Of course I believe that. Of course I believe, darlings, that your path is sovereign 
to you. And I, I think it's dangerous to say something like, oh, well, if you are a Trump supporter, then you're not a real witch. Or if you don't want to get involved in politics, then how can you say that you're a legitimate witch? What are you using your craft for if you're not using it for social justice, dot, dot, dot? Because even though you as an individual or I as an individual may hold the belief that it's a shame not to use witchcraft for anything to do with social justice or progression of wider society or the collective purpose, that doesn't mean that people that don't use it for those things aren't witches. That is almost just like scrubbing out a reality. It is a reality that there are witches who are pro-Trump. It is a reality that there are witches who are non-political. They do not align with anything politically, particularly. It is a reality that there are witches who are um, not necessarily invested in, in anything much to do with the collective consensus reality. And we have to accept that those witches are, they're real witches. They have a practice. They're doing their thing. And even if one may, may look at that practice and think, well, that's a waste or that's not where the priority should be or isn't this a crying shame? It doesn't make them any less of a witch for, for operating in a way that you consider to be unfortunate or maybe a bit half-baked, if you will. I can definitely see why the practice of witchcraft is taken in a political light and it is seen as a political position in a way. I think it can be seen as that for definite, but I think to make a blanket statement that says that any witch who doesn't think in this way and isn't operating in this way isn't a witch is heavy-handed and is basically just a denial of the reality which is way more complicated than that and there are so many different types of witches and our views on politics are as varied as the types of craft that we practice under the umbrella if you will. Over the course of my time getting involved in witchy dialogue and being a part of the online witchy community specifically I have definitely seen spates of videos and conversations that have come up over time about the blended path and how possible it even is to walk a blended path and how legitimate it is or is not to walk that blended path and by the blended path I'm talking about Christo-paganism, I'm talking about the mixture of Christianity with pagan mysticism, whatever you, however you want to say it, you know, whatever description you want to use. Uh, for me, I have always really um, stood in the corner of people walking a blended path. I, whenever I see a conversation taking place where witches are insisting that the blended path is just not a thing or that it shouldn't be a thing, I am always very quick to rock up and make my peace known on that because even though I don't personally walk a blended path, I can completely see how it is more than possible to do so. And I understand, I think on some level, the instinct that people have to walk that blended path and it, it makes sense to me why that would call to a person. So I try to always be a voice of reason in the past whenever I've seen these discussions get very heated and very almost kind of extreme. You know, there are some people who are very vehemently against witches that walk the blended path and wor work with Christ or work with saints or describe themselves as Christian and go to church as well as also practicing the craft. And you know what? I can understand where the some of the anger and the vitriol comes from around witches who claim Christ and claim Christianity, but also state that they are witches. I think it comes from unpleasant experiences that witches have had of having to emancipate themselves from the Christian tradition that they grew up in, uh, being judged for being witches when they told their Christian friends or family members. I think that there's a lot of rejection that goes on when somebody realizes that they're a witch and they have to tell people in their lives, loved ones in their lives who are Christian. It is therefore quite difficult for a witch to accept that there are some witches who fully still embrace the Christian path and they are walking the Christian path to all intents and purposes. I think that can be quite difficult for a witch to swallow once they've completely extracted themselves from, um, from the, the God flock, if you will. And so it's hard to see some witches still walking with one foot in that world. But I do think that that is shadow work that needs to be done from the perspective of the witch who's walked away from the church rather than making it the problem of a witch who's walking a blended path and just being honest about that and it's hard to be honest about it as well sometimes it is difficult for witches who are walking a blended path to be upfront and open and i think that they ought to be rewarded and respected for doing so um, on a public platform rather than be chided for it and, and derided for it. That makes me feel quite sad. And again, I, I can understand the instinct. I understand, I think, to some degree, the urge that somebody feels to really look into and connect with their witchy identity and see themselves as a witch, but not want to depart from what is beautiful about the Christian tradition. And I can see how witches would feel that those two things can be intertwined and how that makes sense. Even though, as I said, it's not something that I do, that's not a path that I walk. 
But I do think that the idea that, that there isn't really such a thing as a blended path or that those witches are just confused and need to come to some sort of a decision is very unfortunate. And I would always ride against that. I think the blended path is, is more than possible and, and often can be very beautiful. One thing that gets my goat that I definitely want to mention in this video, it really winds me up, is this idea that witches shouldn't charge for their witchy gifts. <laughs> if they've got the gift of being able to do astrology or the gift of being able to do tarot, if they can use the ball, if they can do the runes, if they have any of the clairs, clairaudience, clairvoyance, clairsentience and so on, they should not be charging for those things. That This is still definitely something that does the rounds all the time in the dialogues around witchcraft and within the craft. So I wanted to bring it up because I just think that it is so short-sighted and so narrow to say that in all circumstances witches should just be using their gifts for free and should never turn any of their gifts into any kind of business venture, make any money from it, take any kind of exchange for it at all. Obviously I just feel like that's way too heavy-handed and it doesn't account for the fact that any witch can have a gift quote-unquote and don't forget even by saying to a witch, you have a gift, you shouldn't charge for it. You're already being prescriptive with that witch about how they should see their own gift. If they have an ability for something, if they have a talent for something, it's up to them whether or not they see it as a gift from cosmos or a gift from the goddess or a gift from their ancestors even. You do not get to tell that person that they should see their talent, their skill, their power as a gift, you know? That is a decision that they have to come to. But when you say to a witch, oh, you've got the gift and you should not charge, for it you're not really taking into account the time the energy the effort um, maybe even the, the study and the certification the hours of practice that a witch has put into honing that quote-unquote gift so even if a witch agrees with you that indeed their potency with a specific thing their ability with a specific thing is a gift that has been cosmically bestowed or divinely given you may not necessarily be able to convince a witch to come onto the same page as you when it comes to not charging for something that they have sharpened, they have honed, they have perfected that gift. So even if you're on the same page about it being a gift, who are you to say that somebody's endless hours of perfecting that, sharpening that tool, using that skill, learning more and more and getting to true proficiency isn't worth some money changing hands when somebody uses, when the witch uses that gift and also, you know, gives a lot of energy and time to use that gift. Why should that uh, witch not be remunerated? Personally, I'm always completely fine with hearing or reading a specific witch saying something like, I don't feel that I should charge for my gifts or my goddess told me not to charge for what I can do or whatever. It's only... Uh, it only becomes an issue for me when that witch becomes very rigid about everybody having to do the same thing and it becomes a blanket statement about all witches and what all witches should do and of course that is where my guard goes up that is where my portcullis goes down that is where you know that I start to have a problem because you know I'm all about sovereignty and I'm all about the individual journey of the witch or the mystic or whatever so for me that that prescriptive rigid way of looking at things that narrow sense that there are uh, that there shouldn't be any such thing as a witch who does what they do for a living or takes certain skills and and has uh, financial remuneration for them remuneration is financial that's a pointless word but you know remuneration um i think that that is just so heavy-handed and it's so unpleasant if you've made a personal decision for yourself that money changing hands is not supposed to be part of the journey for you with your capabilities within witchcraft fine but i when people start to feel that it's okay for them to lecture other witches about whether or not they're taking money that is where i'm just out if I 5,000, you know, I, I get really... Ugh, it's just like, no, you don't get to tell another witch what to do. When I first came into the online witchy space and I was getting involved in a lot of dialogues and debates and conversations, it was so interesting. I came into forums first and then I started lurking on YouTube and commenting on different videos on YouTube. And then eventually I sort of came out of my shell and got my own YouTube channel and my own Facebook and my own blog and everything. It was really interesting because at the time I felt like there was definitely still a little bit of snobbery and elitism and a bit of a divide between what we know as low magic and high magic. So the idea that you would do magic to, um, you know, get some money into your bank account, get the job that you need, um, have have an improvement in your health or in the health of one of your loved ones. Those things were considered to be sort of like low magic. And this idea of self-actualization and reaching new heights in the astral and creating servitors and things like that, 
that would be more in the high magic section of things. I find that with the advent of Gen Z coming into the witchcraft community and talking about things from their point of view, that there's been quite a refreshing shift when it comes to how high magic and low magic are perceived and whether or not they even should be called high magic and low magic. And this is not to say that millennials weren't having this kind of discussion or that we never did have this discussion in the witchy community. Uh, but I think Gen Z have come through with this very refreshing desire to break down elitism and to recognise snobbery when it comes to how we perceive certain types of magic. And it sort of it sort of goes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, really. The high magic, the lofty, ceremonial, you know, self-developmental magic where you really sort of go forth with your, with your powers, sort of flexing your powers and seeing what you can do and gathering momentum as a magician. That's the kind of shit that you can really enjoy getting on with once your basic needs are fulfilled. You know, if you've got that that bottom foundation of things in Maslow's hierarchy of needs dealt with and seen to, then yes, of course you can go for gold and, and do this self-actualizing magic. But I think that if Maslow's hierarchy of needs are, you know, rocky in the foundations for you, if you do struggle with things like money and job security and home security, then you are going to be practicing um, what could quote unquote be called low magic. And there's actually nothing low about it. It's exactly what witchcraft can be conceivably used for. So I'm really happy that that sort of um, that divide between the lofty, you know, meaningful magic and the, you know, sort of like base, you know, sort of low magic, if you will, the real world concerns type thing. I'm glad that we are bridging the gap and we are not thinking of any kind of magic as being kind of like lowly or beneath us if we want to be serious about our craft. We really can just look at everything as as being a, a worthy reason to do magic if, if the need arises. I suppose that wasn't really a misunderstanding or a mistake or a misconception. It's more of a misconception that I feel is being cleared up, which is a positive way for me to end this video. Hopefully this has been enriching. I would love to know down below, what are the misconceptions and the mistakes that you have come across in your journey in witchcraft? What are the misconceptions and mistakes that you have personally been making that you feel that you would like to kind of shift or move away from at this point in time? What for you is the most interesting thing that I said in this video? Did it make you think? think? Is it something that you agree with or vehemently disagree with? I'm happy with all forms of discussion as long as they are respectful and don't be afraid to comment to each other and get those dialogues going as well. Much love darlings and until next time, blessed be. Mwah.